Good evening, everyone. My name is Carol Golsh, and tonight is the April 18th, 2021 meeting of the Monterey Bay chapter of the California Rare Fruit Growers. We're delighted this evening to be talking with Dan Wally, Wiley, sorry, all the way from Australia, Sydney, Australia. Um, I think this might be the first international meeting that we've done by Zoom, so we can be excited about more than one thing this evening. We've reached out so far. We're gonna be talking tonight about Dan's work on research in citrus and bringing new citrus varieties to the market and the broader audience. So with that, I will let Dan begin and let's take it away. Okay, so I wanted to start off just by um, uh, give a little introduction about my, my background. So I have a little video. Um, that I put together. Okay, so, so I'm actually a, a computer engineer and I moved to the San Francisco Bay, Bay Area from uh, Chicago where I used to work at Motorola during the dot-com boom. And I've always, always loved citrus and I was so excited to live, be living in California where I could actually grow um, citrus. I used to, I grew up in Georgia and I'd go to my grandparents' um, house in Florida and I just loved eating the oranges right off of their tree there. And shortly after I came to California, I visited the citrus variety collection where if you don't know about that at UC Riverside, they have this, this uh, scientific collection. It's, they have, I think, more than a thousand varieties, it's like two trees of um, every variety. It's like a Noah's Ark of citrus. And I was just so, so amazed. And I, I really loved it. And um, I, it, when I was there, I learned about the Citrus Clonal Protection Program where they, um, they provide budwood. What they do is they, they take varieties and create disease-free sources of those varieties. And I was so excited at this idea that I could, could uh, you know, I learned to graft and that I could grow these, these varieties, just order the budwood and grow, um, you know, hundreds, this is their inside their protected greenhouse. I could grow hundreds of citrus varieties in my yard just by putting in an order to the CCPP and they ship the budwood right to your house and um, you get the budwood you graft with it. And so this video is gonna show a little bit about how they remove the diseases from the citrus. So when people sit in, send in cuttings to the CCPP, first they put them in these test tubes and they get them um, to, um, they get the buds on those cuttings that have been sent in to grow out. And then they take, um, they take pieces of that. First, they, they also grow their rootstocks in a test tube and they'll use that for, for the grafting. It, the procedure is called shoot tip grafting. And they do this under a microscope and they take um, that little shoot that they grew in the test tube and they cut off all of the, the leaves and everything, um, what they do is they cut off the very end of what's called the apical meristem and then they will use that to graft to that little root stock that they grew in a test tube. So it's a, you know, it requires a steady hand and a lot of precision. So they cut that out and then he's doing a graft right there, a really small graft. And then he's going to move that into a test tube, into another test tube and see if that graft will grow. And the failure rate on this procedure is pretty high. They only get about one in 10 to grow. When I was filming this for my YouTube channel, I, I think I had to take three trips to Riverside before I, I could get this, um, get this on camera, one that actually worked. 
And then they take that little tree from the test tube once that grows and they graft it to a larger tree to get it to grow faster. Maybe I should have sped, sped this up. I'll speed it up a little. But anyway, so they graft that to the bigger tree and then they, they put it in a growth chamber and that gets that to grow faster. And then they, what can happen is you, they may not always get the disease. So normally the, the goal is to find a point at the end of the shoot tip where the disease, it's growing so fast, the disease hasn't made it into that area of the tissue. So they, the way it, the procedure works is they get a piece of tissue where the disease hasn't reached and then they actually test it. Um, they do a, a DNA test. It's, it's much like what's, uh, what's used to detect COVID these days, a, a test called um, PCR, where they actually look for the DNA of various diseases and they get a, a readout on the computer screen and they can see if the disease is present um, in the tissue. So they, they, they run this test after they do the shoot tip grafting just to make sure that, um, that they got a piece of the shoot tip that had no disease. And then they, they repeat this if they find disease. So they know if they find the disease, they have to do the shoot tip grafting again. And so this, this shows my apartment in San Francisco not long after I moved to San Francisco, you could see my balcony. I have a lot of citrus trees there, even though it's not really a great place to grow citrus. And then, um, in, okay, so, so around the time I was living in San Francisco, this disease called HLB started spreading in Florida. And it was actually spread um, to a large extent by citrus nurseries in Florida. Um, because they, um, they moved trees that had these insects called Asian citrusylids. And they also had the Huanglong Bing disease. So they, they made the mistake in Florida of um, assuming that just because they had this insect called the psyllid, that they wouldn't necessarily have the disease in the state because that had been observed to be the case in um, most of South America, that South America had had this psyllid for a long time, but they didn't have the disease, so it wasn't a big problem. But so Florida didn't take the right action um, and that caused this disease to spread all over the state. So they didn't properly protect their nurseries in time and the disease just spread all over actually um, in trees that were shipped from um, from production nurseries in Miami. But um, California observed that and they've taken really strong measures in the nurseries to avoid that sort of scenario that we saw in Florida. So in 2000, 2007, I got married and we moved to Gilroy and to a house where I actually had a citrus tree in the yard. And then I, I really enjoyed ordering the budwood from CCPP. You could see there I am with my daughter and our navel orange tree. I grafted, I think about 30 varieties to that tree. And I really enjoyed, um, enjoyed all the fruit from that tree. And here you see this Asian citrus psyllid that has spread. Um, um, here, this shows this insect spreading in Southern California. So, um, it, it spread pretty rapidly over Southern California and it's now most of the state of California is quarantined for this um, psyllid. And then in 2000, I think it was 2011, we moved to a new house in Morgan Hill and I, um, I learned that the same thing was happening in California that had happened in Florida in, in uh, April 2012, this Huanglong Bing disease was discovered in a tree in um, Los Angeles. And the suspect was, it was suspected that a graft of pumelo 
had brought this, uh, someone had brought this um, disease from Asia into the state via uh, smuggled pomelo. So someone had grafted pomelo cuttings. This is that first tree um, that was found in California um, with the HLB disease. And this shows how HLB has been spreading from there. So this, um, this, this map that I'm showing you is a little bit, a little bit out of date. Um, it's, it's spread further than this, but the, this is what the, st the state was, I think maybe in early 2020. And you can see it's, it's most over most of the LA area and it includes Riverside where the citrus variety collection is. And um, sometime after this happened, I was, I was so disturbed. Um, actually, someone from my local chapter of California Rare Fruit Growers, the Santa Clara Valley chapter, asked me about grafting. They had, some, they had seen um, what I had been doing in my yard, and they asked me about grafting. And I did a Google search. And what I noticed is that most of the content on um, on Google and on YouTube was really, uh, really conducive to the spread of citrus disease in California because they just, there were people who were amateurs. They didn't know anything about the dangers of disease and they would just say, oh, look, I'm taking a cutting from my sister or, so or someone, I'm you know, taking a cutting from their tree. I grafted on my tree at home. This is how you graft citrus without mentioning the disease implications. And I realized that if no one did anything, and it, you, you could actually see in those videos that people in California would say, oh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go, go try your technique now without realizing the implications of that. So I launched a, a YouTube channel to, that would not only teach people how they could, they could graft successfully in their own yard with all of these wonderful varieties from CCPP, but also teach um, how it, it could say it saves our trees from the disease and it, this technology, the shoot tip grafting, if people just order the budwood from CCPP, then the disease does not spread. And um, I re I've received some funding from California Citrus Research Board to make a number of these videos. And you can see I have a lot of videos on grafting. Um, I did a, a two year project where I did a lot of nice videos with Q and A of science. Uh, you may enjoy those. Um, different things about disease, uh, citrus propagation. This video is really interesting. It shows um, the lab where where um, they take samples of trees all over the state and they send them as, to this lab and um, try to find anywhere that HLB is spread and remove those trees, any diseased trees, they, they remove them. And anyway, um, I have some, some videos on on breeding, a lot, a lot of interesting videos that you may want to check out. And um, but my latest, my latest project, um, the C CRB has funded another project um, to it for me to. Uh, basically, what I realized is that the audience on YouTube can help. Um, find citrus varieties that ought to be introduced. And just by, by working with that audience on YouTube, I can um, discover new varieties that ought to be introduced that people would like to be able to graft, but they're, they're not available. So any variety that's not available is a potential disease risk. And I made a video um, Explaining, explaining the project, and I'll, I'll play that for you right now. It has a very interesting aroma. 
I've been working on a project to introduce new citrus varieties to California. I have this crazy goal of making it possible for anyone on earth to grow any type of citrus tree that they'd like to grow. Last year I asked viewers of this channel to share with me varieties of citrus that they'd like to grow but for which trees are not available. One variety that was suggested was developed in the Soviet Union and donated in 1979 to the University of California Riverside Givenon Citrus Variety Collection. I visited a tree at the Givenon Collection and picked some fruit to taste with some young volunteers from the Citrus Clonal Protection Program. It's a very interesting fruit. The um, citrondron is said to be a graft chimera of trifoliate, which is a rootstock, and a satsuma mandarin. And it certainly looks more like a satsuma mandarin than a rootstock fruit. The myth I found on the internet was that the citrondron is the result of a successful experiment by Soviet scientists to create a tree that could not only withstand the bitter cold winters in the Soviet Union, but also bear delicious fruit. We're going to taste it and see whether it's worthy or not. It may be a little late in the season for this fruit, but it looks like we'll be able to get a good taste. You can help in this effort to introduce new varieties by taking a short survey about varieties at fruitmentor.com slash citrus survey. It smells a lot like a nasty rootstock fruit that I wouldn't want to eat. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I'll go first. We're taking turns. Or, or, let's see. Let's, let's get that little. Mm. Let's give you the best tasting <laughs> flesh. Thank you. It looks delicious. But the smell, I don't know. Okay, let's, I'm gonna go for it. Oh, <laughs> oh nasty. <laughs> <coughs> oh. Went down the wrong way, but that's oh. bad. Oh. That may be one of the nastiest um, citrus fruits that I've ever tried. I would not recommend this for introduction. Do you, what do you all think? Hard pass. Yes, no, absolutely not. It sure fails the flavor <laughs> test. Please take the survey. So for the, the presentation, um, I put together a little, a little bit of background on on citrus varieties and a little bit about citrus breeding. So I, I took I took these these diagrams from a really great uh, pretty new book called the genus citrus, which I, I high, highly recommend to um, anyone who would like to learn more. But but basically, this is the scientific thought on the origin of citrus. Um, so, so these these on the right hand side, those are like the thought of as the um, the original species of citrus that came from a common origin uh, many million years ago, and this is the um, the current thought on how citrus um, these different varieties spread. And then after the spread of citrus, uh, then humans came along and started, um, started growing um, citrus trees and um, doing some breeding. And I think the, the three main uh, origin uh, species, the three most important are the citrons, mandarins, and pomelos. And the these original species have been, um, you know, have been been bred on purpose and by accident to create uh, our modern varieties. Like you'd see pomelos crossed with, um, let's see, crossed with 
mandarins, created sweet oranges, they created sour oranges, and then sour oranges mixed with citron give you lemons. Um, then you, you get these older mandarins and then there's more, more mixing and then you get the modern sweet oranges, you get modern mandarins, you get uh, pomelo mixed with sweet orange, you get grapefruit. So um, I guess the, the modern varieties, there's really a lot of gene mixing between these, especially mixing of these mandarins and pomelos. And if you look at the, the um, scientists studied the, the DNA and they try to figure out what content of modern varieties is pomelo and mandarin. And they, they can figure this sort of thing out now with the uh, modern um, testing and gene chips, they could figure this stuff out. So you could see some of the, the pomelos that still exist are pure pomelo, but then grapefruit is a mix of of mandarin and pomelo and then you have like washington navel orange it's more mandarin but it has pomelo and then all the way over the left you have mandarin so there's a big spectrum of how much dna of mandarin and pomelo is in a lot of these modern uh like grapefruit um orange mandarin varieties and then uh another another thing when you grow uh, this is sort of an uh, important thing to understand. If you grow a, a citrus tree from seed, the really the normal way to grow a citrus tree is to graft it, but there may be reasons to grow from seed, such as breeding. Um, but a lot of citrus varieties, if you plant the seed, you'll get a single plant from one seed. And that's a normal sort of sexual cross where you have genes from the mother and genes from the father to make a new tree. And one thing to note, uh, going back to that ancestral citrus, seeds from pomelo are, are always zygotic. And then there's another, another situation that's really strange in citrus, you can plant the seed of certain varieties and you get multiple seedlings from one seed. Um, and in this case, you can get a clone of the mother plant. And uh, mandarin and orange seeds are often new seller. Although um, I, I'm not really an expert on this, but may, maybe with that ancestral citrus, the mandarins were Maybe they were always new seller. I'm not sure about that. But with all of this gene mixing, this tendency to have the um, new seller offspring, that's also uh, a genetic trait and that varies among varieties. And so then yet there, there's Dan, a further complication. Dan, mm. before you get into more complications, could you uh, refresh for those of us who are a few years past biology, the terms zygotic, zygotic and seller. Yes, please. Okay, so zygotic, it just means you have genes from the mother, mother and the father. So it's, it's like a normal human baby, I guess you could say. Whereas this new seller case, you can imagine, let's say a mother had a baby and it ended up being her clone, <laughs> that would be new seller. So, so what happens is somehow within the, the seed, um, something happens so that you get seedlings that are clones of the mother. So it, it's really a pretty strange and unusual thing, but it, it does happen in, in other plants. It's not unique to citrus, but it, it's kind of a strange thing. Mostly when you plant a seed, you get offspring that's that has half the genes of the mother and half of the father. But with citrus, you can get offspring that's a clone of the mother. Um, did, did that make, make sense? It, it certainly did. And I, I okay. thank you for interrupting the flow. Now I think we can go on to the other complications. Oh, no, no, that's, <laughs> that's okay. I'm glad, 
but but then there's another thing that can happen is is also you you could have from one seed you could have a zygotic offspring and a new seller so you could actually have two kinds of offspring in some cases and um anyway so i i think this will be useful to understand this for for some of the other um when we get into the varieties. So growing from seed, um, some things about growing from seed, the seedlings um, will have certain juvenile characteristics if you plant uh, citrus from seed. And one of those characteristics is long thorns. Another characteristic is that it can take a very long time for a citrus seedling to fruit. So those are, um, a couple of traits that you would see if you plant a citrus seed. And then another thing about growing citrus from seed is it tends to elim eliminate most diseases, but it doesn't eliminate all citrus diseases. Whoops. Um, I think I showed this in my little video clip. Um, but anyway, so after this, shortly after I read this article, there was a presentation by David Karp to the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the California Rare Fruit Growers. And I, I went to his presentation and he had done a tour of Vietnamese nurseries in California. And he was observing that even after this catastrophe of the discovery of, of Huang Lung Bing disease in California, that there were, there were small nurseries out there selling um, selling trees that appeared not to be derived from the proper bud sources from CCPP. I, I found that quite disturbing. Um, and I thought something ought to be done about that. And so th this leads into the, the slides of, um, so last year I introduced a number of, of new varieties based on the, my citrus research board project. And um, one of these, I think this may be the very, very most important variety that I've introduced. Um, uh, I actually met, met my friend Anne and her husband, Jeff. I met, met Anne and Jeff through my, my website. And Anne is from Vietnamese. I'm sorry, Anne is Vietnamese. She's very much American too. So she understands both cultures and she helped me to understand um, these pomelos that were being propagated. And she, she also helped me track down a number of trees. But this, this one, one variety, I had tried to introduce it um, several times. The first two times were from a yard in San Jose um, where Anne had a friend who was, was growing this, this, um, this tree. And I, I can't pronounce the, the Vietnamese, but, but the name, what it really means is guava pomelo. And it's, it's named not for the flavor of the fruit, but for the shape of the fruit. So in English, I think we would call that pyriform or pear shaped, but in Vietnamese, I think they think of it as guava shaped. But anyway, I had tried to introduce this a couple times from a tree in San Jose and it failed both times because that shoot tip grafting procedure fails a lot. And I tried it a third time last year from another tree that Anne had found from someone in Orange County. And we finally got that going in the citrus clonal protection program. And so with Anne and Jeff, we actually took a tour of nurseries um, in California. And we, we saw that this was very commonly sold by small nurseries in California and that it was being propagated. Uh, it looked like it was being propagated in Riverside where they now have Huang Lung Bing and also being sold in um, Orange County. So it's been readily available in small nurseries in Orange County and people have moved it um, been moving these around the state. Anyway, on my trip last year, I visited one nursery. I didn't see them selling these anymore, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are small nurseries selling these trees. And if people were 
to buy these and move them um, to other parts of California. Um, the basically is the disease HLB disease spreads in California. This, there'd be a larger and larger risk if these trees continue to be sold in um, in California. So anyway, this this is a variety um, whose introduction has has been started. It it um, so you see it has the pear shape and it has uh, has somewhat dry flesh and it's very low acid. And I would call this a culturally significant fruit in that many people, um, many Vietnamese people really enjoy having this fruit around New Year. And I think it may be to try to ex explain how that's important. It, it would be kind of like, like in my family, we, we love to have a Christmas tree at Christmas every year. We love the smell of the Christmas tree in the house. And it's hard, hard to imagine, um, you know, not having a Christmas tree for Christmas. Um, we actually moved into our current house like 10 days after Christmas. I'm sorry, 10 days before Christmas. We did, couldn't get a Christmas tree. I ended up making, we ended up decorating a lemon tree. So we still had a Christmas tree. So I think for many people, this fruit is very important in that way. And, but anyway, so on, on to the next fruits. And um, these other fruits are, these up next two, they're also Vietnamese fruits. And they, um, so I, I sent an email to members of my audience last year and uh, one person wrote back that he had these these trees, and one of them was definitely fruiting. And he sent in the the um, I worked with them to get the cut into the citrus clonal protection program. So the introduction of these two varieties has started. Also, um, there's also a Chinese variety called Sa Tin Yao um, that I think is is uh, similar. Um, I understand it's a low, low acid fruit and the introduction of that one was initiated last year too. Um, this is one of the most requested varieties that I had. So I saw in the survey th this year that um, people have sent in in the last week and, and member, I've seen it from members of um, of the Northern California CRFG groups. They've sent in the request for this one. It, it's a very popular request. Even people on my Spanish language channel have requested this. Um, it's, it's called, it has several names like Sorrento lemon. Um, I think maybe Amalfi Coast lemon, but this is a very popular variety and the introduction was started last year based on, um, those um, those responses last year. This is an, yet another variety. Um, this had been sold by a nursery in Fremont. It's it's a very old heirloom, uh, Satsuma Mandarin. It was uh, collected in Fremont in March 2020. This the source tree has a lot of shade right now. It's not. A productive tree, but we found this one fruit on the ground that we suspect may have been from that tree. But anyway, this the introduction of this variety has been initiated. Yet another one that had had a number of requests is this fruit called I, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Shikwasa. It's a Japanese variety. It's a small sour mandarin. It's very famous. There's a lot on the web in Japanese and English about supposed health benefits and so forth. Um, apparently Coca-Cola has a drink with this flavor, a Fanta drink in Japan, and that one has been initiated um, with material from the citrus variety collection. This is yet another one where there were a number of requests, a fruit called Ujukitsu. Um, it tastes like a sweet lemon. Um, 
possibly a sweet orange hybrid. Um, it's been sold, uh, sold in some other states and um, I, I tasted it, it's, it's uh, really nice, but this one was initiated. And this one was, I believe, recommended for introduction by uh, multiple members of the Monterey Bay CRFG um, chapter and escaped from the citrus variety collection and people who tasted it requested it. Um, I tasted it with some volunteers in the CCPP lab. We liked it. Um, and it, it was clear that this one should be introduced. So the introduction of this one was in, initiated in 2020. Um, so, so the last time I've, I've been to the tour at Gene Lester's house two times. The last time was in 2016. And um, that's my daughter, Hannah. The two of us went on that tour and this is the tree. This one was also highly requested by members of the Monterey Bay chapter. Jean, I, I understand Gene Lester called this black twig lime. And um, I guess it was said to have been grown from a seed of this, um, of the winged lime uh, known as Citrus longaspina wester. And I guess the longaspina in Latin means long spines, long thorns and there you see the the tag on Jean's tree that says winged when I, I went on that tour in 2016 I was pretty fascinated by this tree it was I thought it was the most interesting thing on the tour the tree has really nasty long thorns and if you remember back the the traits of a, a juvenile citrus tree one of them is long long thorns and um, I guess it's the understanding is that Gene grew this tree from a seed. So it's not surprising that it has nasty long thorns. And the fruit, I thought it was, it was really delicious, really good. But I had discovered this other variety called lemonade just maybe a couple of years before. Uh, and I've really enjoyed that fruit. Um, I'd say it, it's one of my favorite fruits. It's lemonade fruit is, to describe it, it tastes like a lemon, except it's not sour like a lemon. It says, has the same sort of acid sweet balance as an orange, but it has a lemony flavor that's really, uh, really delicious. You can juice it and you can drink that juice straight. And it, it's like lemonade. You don't have to add sugar to it. And California has some, some other sort of sweet lemon, sweet lime fruits. Um, and I think the, the lemonade has a much better flavor than those. But it seemed, seemed to me that Gene's black twig lime tree, um, or he, he called it winged lime, it tasted to me a lot like lemonade. So I thought that was really interesting that maybe the true origin of this lemonade was this um, this winged lime from the Philippines. So um, so I did a little research. I found this this book on the internet um, from 1915. Um, so back in those days, the Philippines was part of the United States. And there was a Swedish American botanist doing a lot of great work in the Philippines, PJ, Peter Wester, PJ. And he wrote, uh, wrote this thing, citrus fruits in the Philippines. And I guess in the Philippines, they also call this fruit talamasan. But if you, you read his description, it's deep lemon colored, the pulp is very juicy, mildly acid, aromatic, pleasantly flavored. So it does sound a lot like Gene's tree. And then he says, he says, except the mandarin, which is also of rare occurrence, it's much superior to all other fruits grown in these islands. Um, very rare, no economic importance. He says the fruit could be used as an aid fruit, just like 
lemonade fruit. You can um, squeeze it and drink it straight. And he says with a little sugar, it would make a good breakfast fruit, which, um, and he says it has formidable spines, which seems to match Gene Lester's tree. And then it has some, some photos in the, uh, in the book. With the black and white photo, you can't really tell much from that. But the next photo is really interesting. So the reason this fruit was called the winged lime is because of the, the shape of the leaf. So it has what's called a winged petiole. I don't, I don't know if you all can see my cursor, but instead of just one big leaf, you have these wings um, on this, the stem. So that's called a winged petiole. And that's why this variety from the Philippines is called the winged lime, is this winged petiole. And if you look at Gene's tree, this is a photo I took in 2016, you can see that his tree has no winged petiole. So that seem, seems, I, I guess at that point I was stumped for, until I found that article, I thought, oh, this lemonade variety must have originated in the Philippines. And here, here's another, another thing I found on the internet. Um, you can actually see a preserved leaf sample there that's in the United States National Herbarium. It was sent sent by, collected by Wester in 1915. Um, so for my, my project after I saw many requests for this winged lime, I thought, okay, let's go to the citrus variety collection and actually look at this winged lime tree and also look at the lemonade fruit and, and try to get to the bottom of this. So here's a photo of the winged lime tree at the citrus variety collection in Riverside. And you can see it has that winged petiole. And that, that's very unusual in a lime, this winged petiole. Okay, so many, many people, so many people requested winged lime based on the understanding that Gene Lester's so-called black twig lime tree is the winged lime. But based on that, it doesn't really seem to be the case. And I, I've noticed that that there are multiple websites out there that are, you know, printing this like it's a fact that this, this um, winged lime, like that Gene Lester has a winged lime tree, but it, it seems, you know, based on the observations at the citrus variety collection, it appears his tree is not a winged lime tree. Uh, so, so this, I guess this, this website is by someone who, who, from Europe who came and spent some time at Gene Lester's house and he photographed the trees. He talked to Gene Lester about them and just printed what he learned from Gene Lester. And then you go over to Wikipedia, you can see that someone referenced his uh, website as if that were authoritative, but I, uh, it looks to me like it's wrong. So when I moved to Australia, so wing, so lemonade, um, it turns out that it actually originated in New Zealand and cuttings of that, I believe, were smuggled into the United States in the 1980s. And someone in the citrus industry found out about it and they brought it into the citrus variety collection. And then I think it, it was released, I think, when the, in the last 10 years, finally, but Gene must have gotten it. I guess my assumption is that Gene planted a seed of lemonade. Um, this, this tree shows, um, so Gene calls it black twig lime. And one thing to note about lemonade trees is they have this very unusual uh, black foliage that's, that's very similar to what you see on Gene's tree. And this is some fruit that I picked at the citrus variety collection. You see the lemonade fruit on the left and the winged lime on the right. So the, the fruit looks quite similar. So I guess it, it wouldn't be that surprising if the, a couple of fruits got mixed up and that um, you know, a, a fruit of a seed of lemonade was planted um, with the, you know, thinking that it was the winged lime because they look so, they look pretty similar. And when I was there, I, 
I tasted with the volunteers, we tasted both the lemonade and the winged lime. And we found that the, the flavor of the lemonade is a lot nicer than the winged lime. And the winged lime is not, I'd say it's not as sweet. And then, but it has, at least the fruit we tasted, it had a bit of an unpleasant aftertaste that's lacking in lemonade. Okay, so, so anyway, that, that's what I discovered about, um, about lemonade versus winged lime. So it looks like Gene Lester's tree is not a winged lime. And it may, may be a lemonade. It may just be a new cellar um, clone of lemonade. Although you, you can't ever say something like that without 100%, you know, with 100% certainty without doing a genetic test. I, I guess my, my question is, is there anyone on the Zoom who's tasted both lemonade um, and Gene Lester's so-called black twig lime tree. Is there anyone there who, who, um, you know, who really believes that his tree is different having, you know, having seen uh, what, what I just showed you? Okay, I, I, I don't hear anyone speaking up. But um, so as I, I go through these other varieties, what, what I would suggest is if, if everyone could take um, a lot, of, a lot of people took the survey, but then there were also a number of people who haven't taken the survey. Um, but you may change your opinions about things based on some of these slides that I'm showing. You may, um, or maybe do, you've forgotten some things. I do see that another Sorry, Dan, ahead. an alternate Dan, I guess you'd say, uh, is saying in the chat that he does think it's different. And Dan, um, if you'd like to unmute, I think we'd love to hear what you think. Yeah, I, I don't think they taste the same. I think one is um, the, the New Zealand lemonade, which I think we got at Costco, <laughs> um, is sweeter than the, the black twig lime. And the branches also, I don't show any signs on the New Zealand lemonade of being dark like the one that Gene had. So is your tree a young, your, your lemonade tree, it, it takes maybe a couple of years to see that black foliage. So it may just be a matter of time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it is a fairly young tree. It's in a pot. So, so the, the ones at Riverside have black uh, bark. The, the ones yeah. at Riverside. So I, I reviewed my photo. You? I reviewed my photographs and um, I was looking for a good photograph with, that showed the black bark on the tree in Riverside, but it was kind of a sunny day and the lighting conditions weren't, weren't ideal. But that is an observed characteristic of the lemonade fruit is this black foliage. I've seen it on my tree. So I, I, uh, you know, I, was, I was growing that um, you know, from the, the, um, the cuttings from the CCPP and I observed the black, black foliage on the lemonade. Okay, so maybe my tree is just not old enough yet. But no. I, I mean, the, the black lime seems to taste like you had indicated, less mm. sweet than the, uh, the New Zealand lemonade. Oh, so you think it's less, uh, less sweet. Yeah, but I think it's like nice. there, there are also a lot of factors that affect the flavor of the fruits as well. Like it may be, it could also be a matter of the rootstocks that they're grafted to that can affect the flavor, the age of the tree. There could be a lot of things, but I mean, may, maybe the right thing to do is to just take some cuttings of the of the black twig and send them to CCPP. That may be the right outcome. But as you saw, it's kind of an expensive procedure um, to do that. So I guess the question is, is it, is it really worthwhile? Like, like that in that one example I showed, we, you know, we tried a fruit and it was kind of based on a myth on the internet and we realized, oh, it's just totally wrong. But I mean, I, I suspect that no one, you know, if 
the the black twig lime, no one would probably be disappointed in the the fruit other than I mean maybe that I wouldn't like the juvenile thorns on it, but and that they would probably enjoy the fruit. But just the question is, I mean, is it really different than lemonade? Is it is it worth it? I guess that's that's the question. When there are so many other um, like like with this project, so I, I think I said so I, I, it was I got it approved a couple of years ago and it was funded last year and the Citrus Research Board, they liked it enough to fund it for one more year where I originally proposed it, it was a three year project. So I, I guess the question is the the money that I have in the project to spend on this stuff, right? Um, you know, it's just a question of prioritizing these varieties, and and may, maybe we could just do the the uh, so-called black twig lime if people are really convinced that it's worth it and it's different. But then maybe on the other hand, um, you know, it slows down the introduction of other varieties that people like might like more. Um, but but anyway, so so. Um, I guess my suggestion is pe for people, you know, even if you've already taken the survey, maybe you have some new opinion on, on uh, after seeing this presentation, you, you could just submit it again and I'll, I'll collect all of those and I'll work with the citrus industry to, you know, do my best to introduce the right, the right varieties. Um, anyway, so, so maybe we move on from this one. Um, so, so this one, so I, I found a really nice blog post on the Monterey Bay website from a tasting from, I think it was 2019. And so I took this photo from that blog post, but a lot of people have requested this, this variety. And based on what I've seen, I think it ought to be introduced. Um, this Mandarin. Uh, I think one person had suggested it last year. And um, actually, maybe that one person suggesting it made me think that for the second year of the project, it would be a really good idea to actually, you know, work with the members of the Monterey Bay chapter and figure out is this thing really um, you know, maybe I have have a few members on my mailing list from the Monterey Bay chapter, but I just don't have enough um, people that I, I didn't get enough survey results. And what I've seen based on Carol's email that she sent out to everyone, the results I've seen so far is there's enough, there's definitely enough interest. I think it would make sense to introduce this, um, this Mandarin. Okay, next, next slide. So so this one, so actually, so I published my that video, uh, I think a little more than a week ago or maybe a week ago now. And I had seen some, I got about 250 responses so far um, in response to that video. And I had seen some some people had requested this, this um, variety called Sunquat. And then just today, I, I, uh, Carol said she sent out a second email reminding people to take the survey and someone, I believe someone said that they were growing this. And then I see that um, it was in the tasting. And th I guess that makes me think that it's probably worthy of, of introduction. So are there, are there any comments from, from people on that? You want to see this one introduced? So again, if you've, if you've tasted this one and have something that you'd like to say, Please go ahead and unmute yourself and contribute to the conversation. Okay, well, I, I'm not hearing anything, so I guess I should should move on. Um, but if anyone has an opinion on this that it ought to be introduced, that they can, um, and they didn't indicate that in their survey, they can they can go ahead and do that. So this is a, another one that I saw I saw when I published my original when I published that video and, and uh, got 250 responses, some of those responses 
Um, there were actually several people from Texas had indicated uh, that they were interested in something that they were calling golden grapefruit. So I was looking into that and I thought that maybe that the golden grapefruit is the same thing as this variety called poor man orange. And this seems to be a pomelo mandarin hybrid. It actually originally came from Australia. And it's also, um, I understand it's very popular in uh, New Zealand. I guess the weather in New Zealand, it sounds as if the weather in New Zealand um, isn't very conducive to grapefruits and pomelos. Maybe it's, it's too cold, but this is a very popular fruit in New Zealand. And in California, we have some of the same, probably same climate issues where grapefruits, um, like I tried growing grapefruits in, in Gilroy and they were not any good at all. Um, someone, someone gave the tip to, grow, to leave it on the tree an extra year. I left my grapefruit on the tree an extra year and they were still terrible. So to me, this, this seems like a really interesting variety. I don't think anyone from the Monterey Bay chapter uh, gave this in their survey results. But then I saw that on the, um, I saw this photo on the citrus tasting. And I also saw that it was, um, I guess on that, that website that I had mentioned, the, the person who had, who had spent some time photographing Gene Lester's trees and put up a website, he had listed this is a variety on his website and it looked like the photo was taken at Gene Lester. So this, this variety has definitely escaped into, you know, in, into the, you know, people's yards. So I guess this is another question. Is this something that you think ought to be introduced? Um, and have you tasted it at Gene, Gene Lester's or this tasting in 2019? What, what did you think? Did you like it? Do you think it should be introduced? Yeah, I see that Tom has left so, a comment. So Dan chat. is this. Sorry, go ahead, Dan. I'm gonna say, I, I thought that this, I've seen articles on this and it sometimes is, said to be synonymous with the New Zealand grapefruit. And that, thought, that's right. Yeah, I that's, thought that's CCP, right. doesn't CCPP have New Zealand grapefruit? I don't Sometimes. think so. No? I'll go look it up. Yeah, am, am, am I wrong on that? Tom is also adding. I, I don't think they have it. Like, maybe. OK, yeah. I, I might be wrong. Yeah. Tom, uh, could you unmute and tell us a little bit about your experience with it? Um, I think it's an excellent low heat citrus tree for Northern California, California and climates that have a hard time producing quality sweet citrus. I've eaten it from several trees in Northern California and been impressed. Um, it's similar to cocktail, um, which is widely available. Um, it's generally, it's, at least the trees that I've seen have been more vigorous. Um, I think its quality characteristics seem passed on to progeny. As yes, I've got a poor man seedling that might be, I don't know, 15 years old, maybe more now, um, that produces like very, very high quality fruit in a heat challenged climate. So do you think that was a, a new seller that it, it may have been, does it, it looks, it looks like the same, pretty much the same fruit, like maybe it's the clone of the mother? No, definitely not. Um, it was open pollinated, I'm guessing with a lime. Um, it's something that it, you know, citrus tastings in the past prior to sort of HLB quarantine stuff, a wide variety of CRFG people thought was was pretty outstanding but I think the the quality fruit in a low heat climate is really worthy and so many of the selections are for 
you know, places where you can grow all sorts of quality citrus. And so finding things that are productive and heat challenged areas. Um, and I'm in a very heat challenged area, I, I think is excellent. Okay. So this, it sounds like, like a winner. I, th uh, I think you. we can move on to the next fruit. Yeah. Thank you, Tom yes, and Dan you. for your, for your comments on that. That's, I think that's very encouraging. I just have one quick question. Is there a difference between a pomelo and a pomelo or is it just different spellings? It just, it just people, I think, can pron they pronounce it different and they spell it different, okay, but it's the but same. It's the same category same of fruit. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> right. This is most citrus novice. <laughs> okay, this this is another one that it looked to me like it's in Gene Lester's um, yard. And I saw some, some people um, in my first survey were saying that this, um, you know, it's, an interesting variety. And, but I didn't see this on the tasting, um, that tasting page from Gene Lester's. So I didn't see it on the tasting. I didn't, I didn't hear from anyone on the, um, on the CRFG survey that they were interested in this. So I'm wondering if maybe it was just overlooked, maybe people haven't tasted it at Gene Lester's place, but uh, when I, I read about it on the citrus variety collection, it, it sounds like um, it might be something desirable. So does anyone have any feedback on this variety, Can Koji? Has anyone tasted this at Gene Lester's place? Is anyone growing this? I, I did taste it at Gene's place and um, I, I'd pass on this one, especially if it's costly. It tends to get dried out very quickly. And um, I don't know, there's, I think there's a lot of other good things out there. Like the, the New Zealand grapefruit is definitely superior to this one, poor man's orange. Mm -hmm. So anyone, anyone else? Okay, so no, one, no one's growing. It sounds like the, it may not be that great. So maybe this is a pass. Any other feedback from anyone? Okay. So here's, here's another, another one. Um, so Gene Lester, I guess he was, he grew something that I guess he called it maybe Mandalo. And I guess I'm wondering, is that the same as cocktail or is it different? Does anyone, has anyone tasted the fruit at Gene's house and they think that it's different from a regular cocktail grapefruit? Well, Dan, I, I think I, we were chatting mm. via email and I don't know, it just, it does seem different to me. Um, I, I think it's juicier. And again, I think the pictures I sent you indicate it had fewer seeds. Understanding I'm only comparing two fruit. Um, but the, the ones I've had in the past also have not had very many seeds. And so I, I was actually surprised that they were the same until then, then uh, I looked after you had pointed out to me that they, they were supposed to be the same. And then, yeah, I see all kinds of Google searches and it, they're supposed to be the same. But maybe Jeans was a, a seedling that has unique qualities. So is, has anyone else tasted the um, fruit that called the gene called Mandalo? Yeah, uh, this is Irene. I have tasted it, but I don't, the, the one from Jean, I thought it wasn't as sweet as the one that were labeled as cocktail pomelo from, from the Asian store. In fact, I, I, I have another one in, in the garage right now that I haven't eaten yet. I mean, the, the cocktail ones definitely seem to be juicier and lots of seeds. Now, now my, my question is, will it come true from seed if I grow them? I, I don't know the answer to that, that question, but we're not really supposed to be growing um, any citrus from seed in oh, California. Oh, that's right. It's, yeah, yeah. It's John, not, John reminded me that. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, not allowed anymore oh. um, in California. For, for what it's worth, um, I ate the, what Gene called Mandalo. 
at his place a number of years. Um, always thought it was a worthy fruit. Um, my very hazy recollection and some conversation with him was that I thought that was a seedling. It certainly tastes very similar to cocktail, but I don't think I've ever eaten them side by side. So couldn't say for sure. So, so Irene, from your, if you're comparing it to something that was bought in an Asian grocery store, it's, it's not really a fair comparison because that may have been grown in the Central Valley or Southern California or something, someplace with a very different climate, whereas uh, Northern California's heat, heat challenge. So it's not really a fair, um, it not a fair comparison. It isn't, isn't Gene's place considered to be, I mean, didn't, didn't he buy the place because they have a lot more heat than well, I, I can't comment on that, but in I general, can. Northern <laughs> California versus versus Central Valley, Southern California, there's just no no comparison. Uh, Irene, I oh, live okay. two properties away from Jean's property, and I would say in general, we do not have lots of heat. Um, it's not like it's really cold. You know, we're not like at the ocean like you are, but I wouldn't call it hot, uh, except oh, for today. Okay. We got up to 80 degrees today wild anyway that's just my take on heat i wouldn't say that we have it okay well i i guess you, you're right dan in that case uh you cannot compare because the the cocktail one that i i have tasted many times uh it's like it's like sugar juicy sugar right and, and the one from jean were not quite as sweet i i didn't think it was that sweet but it, it just may be because of the climate. And also it may be the time of year. One thing that I really love about this cocktail hybrid, um, at least my experience in, in my yard is if you leave it on the tree, it tends to hold pretty well on the tree and get sweeter and sweeter. Do other people have that same experience? Yeah, I, I have that same experience. I think it's, it's, I'm guessing it's because of the grapefruit or Pomelo parentage and same type of thing. If you leave it on longer, some of that sweetness comes up and that bitterness goes away. Um, yeah, I think a cocktail does the same thing, and it doesn't. And it doesn't dry out like some. So yeah, uh, very juicy, really nice. Uh, Ellen is just commenting uh, that Jean never claimed the cocktail was the same as the Mondolo. Uh, Ellen, would you like to just? Uh, chat about that a little bit? Sorry, yeah, that was me. This is Freddie. Oh, hi, and, Freddie. Um, yeah, I, I, I've tasted the Mandalo many times and Gene never, where did the theory come from? That this is so the so I'm, ba I'm basing never, that, that, that it might be the same based on other things I've read on the internet. And as we know, things that we read on the internet, uh, you know, you uh -huh. could take a lot of that with a grain of salt, like that that Russian variety is a- Sure, it looks, success. it looks kind of similar, but the mandala was pretty big and it was pretty bitter and pretty sour. It was not as good as the cocktail. Not as good as cocktail. No, it wasn't really a very good fruit. It was, it was pretty harsh. I mean, I remember one, sit, one situation, a bunch of ladies had picked the, a, a bag of mandalos and they worked their way up Gene's driveway in the tasting and they started getting into the better things, the mandarins and all those mandalos went rolling down the driveway, they dumped them out and rolled them down the driveway started filling their bags with something more palatable. So people weren't that excited, but was it early in the season and just maybe with more time, they would have been- Well, leader. it was always in beginning of, you know, it was in March, but I've tasted, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess I've tasted both and they're not the same thing. So it, I guess um, I was seeing the suggestion that they're the same thing on that same website that says, you know, the guy who's, who, stayed at Gene Lester's house and took the photos. He has a lot of inaccurate stuff on his website. The uh, guy from Finland, actually. Right, right, huh. yeah. Well, any, anyway, so let's let's move on to the next fruit. Dan, uh, can I back up a second and, sure, a, sure. and ask you a quick question that I didn't catch? Does the lemonade have a winged petiole or not? The lemonade does not have a winged 
petiole. Jeans has a winged petiole, but it's not as prominent a wing as the one you showed from the Philippines. I have samples here to show to my video screen if you, if you want to look at it. But, yeah, um, sure. Let's let's see that. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. Can you see that? Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. Although a lot of the, the leaves didn't didn't show didn't show bit, uh, pe the wings, but seems like the older wings or the older leaves did. Hey, uh, Freddie, could you uh, show that again? I, I wasn't able I wasn't able to see it. I'll try. You need to share your screen. Uh, good luck. <laughs> oh well, yeah, Dan has. To oh, it up, I, why, have why to don't do I? Why don't I turn okay. off my my presentation for a second so that people can see that big? Okay. Wh which one is which? Uh, they're both. They're both winged lime leaves, different ages or different sizes. Oh. But you can see even this big one has a, a, a minute wing structure on the petiole. And, and the young leaves don't seem to show that, but the older leaves do. Did everyone see that? Yes. Okay. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Sure. So I'd say that that's an argument in favor of introducing that. Yeah, it's really good too. It's got a very nice lime pomelo flavor, so. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hi, this is Sharon. So I have seedling trees from Jean's fruit. Um, I grew these three years ago before we were not allowed to grow from seeds. And I actually have multiple seedlings, all from the same fruit. And this is what the leaf looks like. And it looks to me, they all have this leaf. Uh, so these look more like an ordinary mandarin orange leaf. It, it's much less, um, you know, it's much less broad than what Freddie was just showing. So, so Freddie, were, were your trees, um, so were those taken from a seed or from a graft from Gene's tree? A graft from Gene's tree. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So and that's probably why. I don't know, Sharon, yours looks pretty similar to mine. Mine only, I mean, not very many of them get the big round shape i wouldn't make that judgment based on looking at that leaf that's very similar to most of the leaves on my tree and it does have a little bit of a petiole wing it's got a very you know compare that to a mandarin i think it's more winged than a mandarin really okay i'll, I'll go yeah. i'll go on and compare tomorrow i don't i don't have that many citrus trees to compare uh but when my seedlings grew out, I was expecting more prominent wings since um, black twig lime is supposed to be a papeda. And I thought papetas, most, most of them have uh, the broader petiole than the other citrus. You might have to wait. Okay, okay. Great, thank you. Okay, well, I'll go back to sharing my power, PowerPoint. Yeah, and Dan, just as a point of interest, we have, you know, approximately half an hour left for our meeting tonight. And I'd oh, like to- Oh, wow, I better, yeah. I better speed up. Yeah. <laughs> Let me speed up. <laughs> and I'd like to leave some, a little bit of time at the end for uh, other questions, et cetera, so. Okay, so Etrog is one that's available. I, someone uh, who filled in the survey is growing this, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, another citron. 
Uh, I saw that Gene Lester has it. I don't know um, how that was available, but, but, but maybe if people have an opinion on this, they could just fill out my survey again if they think this is something that should be introduced. To me, it looks pretty similar to Etrog. And you know, how, how many types of citrons do you really need? And then um, someone was growing Yemen citron. And again, right, how many citrons do you really need? But this one is a lot more different. Dan, um, so uh, I, I could tell you about etolene. Um, most, there, there are only two uses really for this fruit. There is, it, it candies beautifully, you know, so it's used for uh, the peel and it's used uh, it, mostly for a Jewish religious ceremony, a harvest festival in the fall. And all of these varieties can be purchased as fruits if you want them for the harvest festival. You know, they'll sell the, the, the Temani and the Italian one and all of them. Uh, in terms of Jews being interested in growing it for religious purposes, not going to happen because it requires an ungrafted lineage of trees. There cannot have been a graft anywhere in that lineage. And they have people who specialize in inspecting etrog orchards to make sure that all the fruits comply religiously. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know for what other purpose anyone would want to grow that other type. I, I've candied a, a couple of different types of it, it, token. It, it, they're all basically the same. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't see any reason why anyone would want to grow it because the people who are growing it have, have very special needs and they won't be able, they'll, they will import, just import the fruit. They're not going to bother establishing an orchard here. Thank you. Um, so this is a, another one from Gene that seems to have escaped. And um, I guess to me, it sounds like maybe it's not really, maybe it's not really useful, maybe not good for anything, but I've seen evidence on the internet that it has spread from Gene's yard, but there's no one, I don't think there's anyone asking for it. Uh, actually, hey, Dan, um... I actually forgot about asking for that one because I, I do like this one because it does smell a little bit like ginger. So, so is so that I'm the gonna, fruit? I'm gonna the redo fruit? your survey. Okay, is that the fruit or the leaves? Uh, actually both the fruit and the leaves. Okay, well any, anyone else feel free to fill out the survey again. And um, um, so anyway, this this looks so. This is the the Finnish website here, and this is the maybe what the seed came from, and it looks quite quite different. So let's move on. So here's here's another one. Um, I saw that someone sent one of these fruits to um, um, what is it? The weird weird explorer channel. So someone from the Monterey Bay chapter is growing this. Um, and if anyone thinks that this is something that should be introduced, you could give that in a survey result too. I also have some fruits just that, you know, interesting fruits that that uh, I like that I was, I wanted to go through real quick. So I actually took this picture on the right from um, that Monterey Bay tasting. Uh, this is the Wakaiwa tangelo. I, I, I really like this, this variety. It's available now. Um, but you note the difference in the color of the flesh. The one on the left grown in the Central Valley, the one on the right, I presume Monterey Bay, just the climate affects the color of this fruit. This is another one I really like. Sorry, the picture is not that great, but the un Encore Mandarin, it's a great late season Mandarin. It has a lot of seeds, but it, it's so delicious. It's worth um, worth it, even with the seeds. It's, Isn't yeah. Encore already available from seeds? Yeah, 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 that's right. I'm, I'm just going over some that you can, you can get right now that I think are, are good. Um, actually, this one, I'm not sure in Monterey, you know, Northern California, how, how good this one is, uh, Chironha, but I, I think it's a really cool fruit, but probably there are two of them. Um, I think I, I like the one, the 436, it's more like an orange, whereas the 559 is more like a, a grapefruit. Um, 
just this is kind of a really weird variety that I just think is really cool. It's a Bocatier de Denis sour orange. It it's actually this variety of sour orange is grown for the flowers more than the fruit. But these the fruit has this um, it has double flowers. It's used per, for perfume in the perfume industry in France. But the fruit has this bizarre uh, fruit inside a fruit. And just if you want to grow something that's really weird and interesting like this, that might be a fun one to grow. And then you get to see the double flower. This is available now. And, and maybe it would make a good marmalade. It's a sour orange. Oh, I already did Chirona. Okay, that, that's it, Q&A. So here we go. <laughs> oh, one, one more. I forgot my, my other show and tell. Seedless Kishu. Ooh. Um, this, this is one I got here in Australia. But I, Seedless Kishu, it, one thing about it, it, it does really well in the pot. I've noticed uh, in my tree in Northern California, it's not as sweet as the ones in Southern California. But one year I accidentally um, had an irrigation mishap and I didn't get it water in the spring and the the bloom was delayed and what i learned the last the next year was because of that delayed fruit bloom the fruit was maturing later and it made the fruit really sweet just like the ones from southern california so maybe that's an interesting um, citrus hack for people in northern california to try to get sweeter fruit is uh, try to force this um, delayed bloom of your citrus. If you're growing them in pot, I suppose in the ground, maybe it might be too difficult uh, because of the, the roots would spread out and might be hard to deprive them of water, but maybe an interesting hack for people to try. Great. So let's go through a few of the questions that came up in the chat. Uh, the first one was from Rebecca. She was asking if uh, you could repeat the name of the Amalfi uh, lemon. It started out with an S F O. Feminella fusato. I, I, <laughs> it, it's kind of hard to pronounce. Let yeah. me let me just go back to this slide. Thank you. That one certainly sounded interesting. Okay. Uh, so I could just leave that on the screen if you want to go to other questions. Thank you. Sure. Uh, and I think we established that the lemonade was the same as the New Zealand lemonade. Is that right? Graham was asking about that. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I think lemonade is the proper proper name, but for some okay. reason the CCPP calls it New Zealand lemonade. Okay. And Irene asked if lemonade was the same as the sweet lime. No, it's different. Uh, lemonade is it's very it's very different. I like it a lot better than the sweet lime. I mean, some people may like the sweet limes because they have. Um, you know, no acid at all, but the lemonade fruit has acid, kind of like an orange has acid. So you get uh, a sweet and sour balance, kind of like an orange. It's, it's just a very interesting fruit. I, I've shared it with so many people, and I think everyone that I've ever shared it with, if they're, the, you know, if they like gardening at home, they get a tree and they plant it in their yard. And you, you can't buy it in the store. It's just, it's a no brainer to plant that one, the lemonade. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see, Bruce uh, was asking uh, about the portion of the presentation where you showed the lab at UC Riverside growing what looked like de-hulled citrus seeds in test tubes. Uh, he was curious to know what the growing media was. Is it agar? I suspect that's what it was, but I, I wasn't, when I made the video, I wasn't really trying to do a how to <laughs> grow seeds in a test tube. I, they just, you know, um, they were kind enough to give me a rack of test tubes and I took them home and um, did the time lapse to show that growing. I'm not, not sure. I, I think if, if you Google it, you, you can, you know, figure out what they, you know, it, it's pretty common to grow 
uh, grow things in petri dishes or test tubes. Like if you really wanted to figure it out, um, you could Google it. Okay. But also another thing to note is if you try to do something like that, um, like getting fungal contamination in that, in that um, growing media uh, can be a problem, but there are products that you, you can buy to deal with that, right? If someone wants to know more, just send me, a, send me an email okay. and I, I could share more on that. Uh, Irene is asking, what was the name of the first pomelo that is dry and sweet? I think Irene, you must have meant the first one in the presentation. There we go. There it is. Boy, oi, maybe. Okay. All is, right. is this one available uh, to get um, budwood? It's, it's going to take a while because the introduction started last year. So that process is a pretty lengthy process. Oh. Um, but th th there, there will be some others uh, like similar to this available sooner. Okay, and uh, Rob is asking, what are the top five low heat varieties of citrus we should be growing? Um, that, that's, a, that's really top five low heat varieties. That's a pretty hard, hard question, but I mean, which kind of citrus? Mandarins, pumlos, or just overall? Um, Rob is saying overall. Overall. Um, oh, that that that's a, a really hard question. Mm. There's so many good good citrus, but like I mean, just like cocktail grapefruit or or um, you know, so, so many certain citrus fruits hang really well on the tree. They, you could leave them on the tree and they get sweeter and sweeter. Um, like cocktail grapefruit, I think is in that category. Oro Blanco is in that category. Another one that's like that is gold nugget mandarin. I really like gold nugget mandarin. Although I noticed in my house in Gilroy, when I got a bit of a freeze, it seemed to granulate the fruit. So if you're growing gold nugget, you might want to protect that um from the freeze but then the um i also like the um um what is it the um on en encore that's that's probably a good low heat mandarin because it it holds on the tree so well May, maybe someone else can chime in if if uh, that grows well in the cold climate. Uh, I could say something about Encore, not from my own experience, but from my uh, teacher, Orrin Martin. He grows several of those trees at um, Allen Chatwood Garden on UC Santa Cruz campus. And he strongly, strongly recommends that uh, variety for Santa Cruz because uh, they hang for a long time on the tree mm -hmm. And it's it's a summer harvest mandarin, and uh, and he usually he said he usually saves a few on the tree for Thanksgiving, so that's how long they do last. So I I have a graft on my on my tree right now, and I'm waiting for it to grow and fruit. Okay, thank you. So Encore is confirmed good for cold climates. Thank you. Honey Mercot's really good too. Honey Mercot. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's Honey Mercot. Very close to the uh, coast to the coast. Uh, Caffin Mandarin is excellent. Caffin is absolutely delicious. It doesn't it doesn't hang long, but it's fantastic in its season, which is just passing. Um, Kuno Wase is very good. Nova is very good. Those are all grown on La Selva Beach, like less than a mile from the coast, and lots of it, very cool. Uh, Valentine Pomelo colors up really nice and actually tastes really good here. 
I think it's much better than the poor man. Okay. Should we move to, are there any more questions? Uh, one question. Do small citrus, like small mandarins, do they tend to ripen better in cool climate than uh, larger ones? I, I'm not sure about that. I, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Well, there is a couple of questions here from Jack. Um, and they actually have to do with Gene Lester's orchard. So I'm not sure uh, that Dan is the right person to answer this, but he's curious to know um, what the status is of Gene's orchard and whether we're able to get scions from his trees, for example, the black twig lime, that could be tested, quarantined, and ultimately be made part of the CCPP. And as a follow-on question, uh, whether or not UC Riverside is able to do DNA type testing to determine uniqueness of a fruit versus duplication. Again, with the example of the black twig versus the lemonade. And that maybe is something that Dan can help us with. So, so they have this, um, this gene chip where they can, they can run, um, run a sample on the gene chip and figure out a lot about the genetics of a citrus fruit. So I'd say it's a yes to that question. I'm not sure, but that's another thing. It's like expensive and I mean, maybe that's that's something we can do, but if we, you know, we're trying to avoid a duplicate, but then on the other hand, if we do it, then maybe, yeah, maybe that's something that can be done. But it also sounds like there are enough people growing the black twig that even without going into Jeans Lester's yard, we can find someone who could provide cuttings to send in to CCPP. Okay, so I think if, if someone does have that um, plant, uh, maybe you could contact me or contact Dan um, and we'll see if we can you know, kind of make that happen. I think that would be a very interesting oh, so project, go ahead. So actually in my survey, if anyone hasn't taken it yet, there's one question, are you growing anything that you think other people might want to grow? Like when, when I did it the first year of the project, I think I just sent people an email and I said, well, are you frustrated that there's something you can't grow? If so, what is that? But then I thought about the, the questions to ask and I realized that maybe I could do a better job with the question. So one of the questions, are you growing something that you think other people might be able to grow. So if, if anyone out there is growing some of these, these things, if you can answer that in the survey, and then there's a place you could give your, your email address. So if you fill that out and submit your email address, then uh, we could work together and try to introduce um, some of those things if you're, you're growing some of these things. Can I ask another question? You're, you're muted, but go ahead. Straight. There we go. Uh, okay, so Dan, can you elaborate on what you call the black foliage on lemonade and on winged lime? Because uh, the, from the photo, those leaves look green to me. Is it like the underside? Um, it, it's like he said, the, like, I, can you see my cursor? But it's, it's the branches, not the leaves. Okay. Okay. Um, like here's here's another one that shows it pretty well. You could see that the the branches. Yeah, I see the branch. Black. So the foliage is actually not not black. Okay. Yeah, I I, I guess uh, maybe I need to check the definition of foliage, and maybe I I made a mistake there to call that foliage. <laughs> okay, but. okay, because all my seedling trees, um, the the new growth is extremely dark like deep, very, very deep bronze color that I could say, oh, that looks black, but that's only the very, very young leaves. But yeah, with the, like with you could, tree. you can even see it in this picture of Jean's tree that, and it, it happens, I think with maybe a lot of cer certain citrus fruits, mm -hmm. the tips of the leaves, like limes, I think the tips of the leaves will have a reddish color. And then when they mature, they turn green. But here you can see the tips of the leaves of his tree. Yeah, mine's a, a lot darker color. than that. So I don't know if jeans looks like that too, or 
um, those people who have graphs, if they all have that character. Thank you. All right, are there any other questions this evening? All right then, I think that uh, we have kind of come to the end of our session tonight. I want to thank Dan very much for taking the time to prepare all this information for us. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can all see that he put in a great deal of work getting this ready. I do want to encourage everyone, um, as Dan has asked, if you have taken the survey and you have new thoughts, please take it again. If you haven't taken it at all, uh, please take the survey. This will help us all to have access to additional types of fruit uh, in the future. I have put the link in the chat screen and I'm putting it again there now. So you could even just, you know, click that now and take that survey. <laughs> so with that said, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. And Dan, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Well, thank you all. I really appreciate your, uh, your, your input. And I'm really excited that, um, you know, to help everyone be able to grow more of these cool types of fruits. So thank you all awesome. so much. Take care, Dan. Thank and you. Thanks a lot, everyone. Dan. Thank you.